welcome to the podcast, Becoming Disciplined, where we acknowledge that self-discipline is the true starting point for all great achievements. You cannot talk about a subject matter with a friend or a family member who isn't in that, like, in that same mindset as you, right? And so the, the, the circle of people for whom I discuss finances with is very small because I need them to be people who are of disciplined mindset. Today on Becoming Disciplined, we interview the Tashwar family. The Tashwar family has been blessed to pay off a car and two additional student loans and increase their income by $10,000 during a pandemic. Six years ago, the Tashwar family had no idea that they would have started a new business, debt-free, paid off a car and six student loans, and lifted a debt of over $195,000 off of their backs. So today, Erica and Evan, welcome to Becoming Disciplined. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. All righty. All right. For our listeners, I don't invite anyone on this show who is not disciplined in at least one of the following areas, spirituality, mental, physical, emotional, finance, calendar, time, uh, home organization, or data organization. But but before we talk about your area of discipline, let's try to understand your context, because context is everything. Erica and Evan, where did you grow up? Um, So I'll start. I grew up uh, mostly in Western Pennsylvania, like Outside of Pittsburgh, uh, I was born in Johnstown, PA, probably about an hour and a half from Pittsburgh. Mostly grew up in La Trobe, birthplace of Arnold Palmer, Steelers training camp um, for those outside. So I grew up kind of in Western PA, but not in like in the city directly. So that's my context. Um, Erica? I am a military brat. So my father served for 32 years in the U.S. Army. And I was born um, while they were stationed in Seattle, Washington. Mm. Um, but I've lived a little bit of everywhere, um, a total of 11 states and two countries. So. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, my uh, my father did 28 years in the Army, but I, I was on, he, he had me at an older age, so yeah. I was on the retirement end of it. So I grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So, uh, understanding that, did you all grow, or I, I guess I have the answer for Erica, but uh, Evan, did you grow up in a traditional or an unconventional family? So, um, I would say we both talked about this before we saw questions. I'd say traditional with some unconventional twists. So, yeah. you know, my parents were married. I was their, I was their only child. Um, so, you know, they were married up until my mom passed away when I was 13, actually. It was a big way I came to encounter the Lord was just out of the depression of that. Um, you know, she had struggled with uh, depression and mental illness, eventually ended up committing suicide. So that was an unconventional twist of my story. And then my dad got remarried and him and my stepmom, who are still married today, have another child um, that they had together, who's now my sister's 20 now. So, you know, so it's kind of like, the you know conventional but with some unconventional twists i mean you know i'm glad you know my dad was definitely a very faithfully married man you know to both his wives you know certainly but you know had some unconventional twists in there too wow so uh, evan you are a lot older than you look my brother because i thought you was a baby brother i thought he was in his i thought he was in his early 30s you know oh, <laughs> Neither one of us are, but thank no, God for no. thank God for good genes. Thirty-seven, I'll tell on myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you're much much older than I thought, my brother. Hey, and Miss Erica, would you even though it was a military family? I know within the military paradigm, there is conventional and there is unconventional. Yeah. What, what would you I say? Would say? I would say the same thing, right? I, I would say that there are some definite conventional twists to that. That my father was the principal breadwinner in our household, and my mother stayed home right, with all of us, because there were five of us, and we were traveling every 18 months to two years to a new duty station, so there was never really an opportunity for her to work outside of the home, and she was just always, you know, geared and committed to um, helping us. I would say for us, the unconventional twist was that um, when my father um, was getting close to retirement stage in um, the military, he was dealing with a lot of depression issues himself, and he ultimately developed a substance abuse uh, 
issue. And mm. so we had to walk through the process of, um, of, um, of recovery um, with my dad. And he actually now has been um, sober for 19 years, which is a blessing in and of itself. Um, to have watched what he walked through. But I, I would say for us, that unconventional twist was figuring out how our family would navigate when the person that we depended on, right, to be our breadwinner was unable to provide for mm. us. And so that was, um, it was a difficult um, situation, but I'm grateful for it. Um, I learned so much about myself and um, my relationship with God just grew stronger because of it. So now, uh, off, I have an off script question for you all. Sure. Um, how long was it in your relationship before you discovered that you had family members that were struggling with different versions of the same issue? How long was it before y'all figured out? I think out? we knew that even before we were a couple. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess just to give more context of us is um, we were, so I had been in Pittsburgh since 2008. And Erica moved here to get her uh, PhD at Pitt in late 2009, early 2010. We went to the same church. So we were friends for years. Like we had been in the same small group, ran with a lot of the same people. So we had a chance, like I know through small group, especially that's kind of when I learned about her dad, you know, and his past and his story. She learned some of my story. So, the, you know, that was kind of a saving grace of it was there was a lot of things like once we started going out and dating, you know, there weren't a lot of things we had to explain necessarily. We kind of knew, we obviously got to know it on a deeper level. Um, but, you know, I think definitely a glory to God is the fact that, you know, I, I've said this to her multiple times. We've talked about it. I think it's a great healing story. The fact that, you know, if you look psychologically of like, both of us had wounds from, you know, the opposite sex parent, you know what I mean? Her with her dad, me with my mom. And to me, that almost, you know, they they say that, you know, psychologically that parent's supposed to kind of like model for you what you're, how you're supposed to interact with them. So for me, how to interact with women for, you know, her, how to interact with men. So the fact that we both had wounds from that and we're able to come together and still be a good couple and work through in love, I think is really a lot of healing, you know, and a lot of restoration that God did in that, you know, because it should be something that's for damage, but, you know, God makes, you know, beauty for ashes, as they say. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. Powerful, powerful. Yeah. I, uh, my wife and I have similar stories and uh, for the first five years of our relationship, we really struggled because we were trying to do it without Jesus, without God. Right. So, uh, right. We had to learn the hard way that we had to get, you know, we had to get that healing through the Lord. Amen. So uh, how long have you all been married now? So we are actually about to celebrate our fifth wedding anniversary. In, coming up in March. Um, so in March. Solid four and a half. Yeah. So um, but we like he said, we've known each other um, for, you know, 10 years now. We were friends for years before we actually started dating. Shout out to being friends with someone before you start dating them. This Amen. is always really important. That's a good, good piece of relational <laughs> discipline for real. Not that that's yeah. why we're here, but you know. Yeah. A, yeah. So. No, that's good. That is good. That uh, relationship and emotional discipline is a type of discipline. So this is all good stuff. Now, when you were growing up, what, who was the most disciplined person in your early childhood? Who was a good example? Um, I'll say for me, I think, um, you know, for, for specific on the financial side, just since what, you know, it's what we're here discussing primarily, probably my dad, as far as the frugality side, I think that probably before I really learned the whole like Dave Ramsey and financial principles and how to build and have a game plan at the very least, I was frugal. Like, you know, I didn't, I was taught to save. I was taught not to spend excessively. I was taught the value of a dollar. I, you know, I had a job in high school when I wasn't playing football, you know what I mean? So like I was taught the value of money and saving and not be, you know, not being frugal, having that cautiousness in me of like, you live off, you, you know, live off less than what you make. So I think in those ways, you know, he taught me a lot of good things and set a lot of good principles in place that, you know, I had. So then when I got, you know, and he, and he made a lot of good financial moves on the other end, I think it was just things that, you know, I wasn't necessarily taught, but even now that like I'm older, I see some of the moves he made. Like he definitely was always trying to put us in very good positions financially. So definitely my dad was, was good on that. Yeah. And I would say, I don't think I had anyone in my immediate family in my childhood that was financially disciplined, but my mother was extremely spiritually disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, and in our house growing up, she was, my father was not saved when I, I was a kid. 
Um, and but my mother had grown up in church her entire life, and we all went to church with my mother every single Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. It was it was just an expectation, and so all of us, you know, developed a relationship with God. My dad actually finally came to know the Lord once he went to rehab, which was what helped him immensely, I think, above anything else. Um, but I just remember as a kid, I have these vivid memories of my mom constantly praying for my dad and anointing his pillow and anointing his shoes and, you know, asking God to bless him and to, you know, grow him and to change him. And so for me, that was a huge testimony to watch her walk through what she walked through for my parents now have been married um, for this, this coming January will be um, 60 years, actually, that they've been married. And so for to watch what my mom has walked through with my dad since her early 20s, for me was a huge um, lesson in spiritual discipline, right, that there, there is no thing that God can't do. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, and that's the, that's the lesson I learned. Oh, wow. That is so powerful. Yeah. I know that there's some people that need to hear that. I've, I, I've counseled uh, people who were going through the process and uh, they felt like there was never an end, you know, and they, and they had, you know, they were losing faith toward the end. So it's good for them to hear that. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's very powerful. Now, can you all both tell me about uh, both Stellar Fusion Entertainment and the Five Buck Bling Boutique? Can we hear about both of those uh, endeavors? So I heard I was supposed to go first on this question. <laughs> so Five Buck Bling Boutique is my is my um, business, my side hustle, right, as, as Dave Ramsey calls it. Um, I started the business simply because I needed to increase my income. I work in higher ed. Um, and so I have a little bit of flexibility in my schedule that, you know, even though we're considered 12 month employees, we don't work 12 months out of the year, right? Like when you do the math on the calendar. And so when we started walking through this process of debt elimination, I knew that I needed to make more money. And so it, I am an independent consultant of paparazzi accessories. If people are familiar, that's the company that makes the $5 jewelry, right? That everybody hears about. I wore my favorite earrings today. <laughs> um, and so uh, that's where that five buck bling boutique was born. I found out about the business on Facebook. Um, actually, Evan and I um, had have a mutual um, friend who was a consultant. And um, me being the personality that I am, I don't jump into anything without like knowing everything. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to have a conversation with her. And I think I asked her every question, right, possible about this business before I entered in. The thing that made it beautiful is that it only cost $100 to start my business, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it wasn't a big investment. The good thing about it is that the inventory that I received in the beginning allowed me to make a profit from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as if I was just working to make my money back. I knew that if I sold everything that was in the kit, I would make a profit. And from the first day, we determined that our goal was going to be that we would split everything 50-50. So every piece of inventory we sell, 50% goes back into more inventory and 50% goes towards our debt. Um, and that's that's really the story of the business. I've never hidden from people why I started the business. Don't get me wrong. I'm a woman. I love shopping, right? All women love shopping. Um, but I, I didn't start this business just because I was looking for something to do. I had a goal and I knew that I needed to, to increase income. And that has been my goal from the jump. And every year that we've been doing this, this is our third year now, we've seen um, a drastic increase um, in our sales and, and in our growth. And so we're just excited about yeah. it. That's powerful. That is and powerful. To give and a little the entertainment, brother. Cell Fusion Entertainment. So yeah, that's also, you know, my side hustle as a Christian hip hop artist, you know, through PFD. Um, you know, that's something I had started as a side business just to, you know, have for anything like, you know, music gigs, consulting, um, you know, different avenues in the music industry has been a little bit slower in the past few years, you know, A, because of life change and then B, because of the pandemic, you know, obviously like live events and music has kind of, you know, obviously shifted in that. But 
you know, I think that's even a testimony of, you know, being able to pivot, you know, that's where I think, a, you know, a piece of financial discipline is having those multiple streams of income, like, because for the, for me, I had that and I was also driving Uber and those kind of, you know, for safety reasons, it, you know, both kind of dried up a little bit, but, you know, being able to pivot, you know, into things and do more on my job, do a little more consulting, you know, that's another way we are able to increase income is, you know, her working on a consulting project. So it's like, I think that's a key piece of financial discipline is being able to pivot and having the sources to pivot to because, you know, things can happen. I mean, who knew this pandemic was going to hit and like, you know, something as simple as, I mean, you, you never would have told me, oh, you can't book a gig, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, you know, but right. now it's like, who's booking gigs? Literally, you know, they're right. just announcing new COVID restrictions. So it's like, and I've been posting, that's one thing on my financial coaching page I've been posting is like, you know, shutdowns could happen again. Are you ready? Like, and that's the message, like, I really want to send, like, are you ready? And I'm sure we'll get into that on other questions, but like, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's kind of our side hustles to give context. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing we have in common, Evan. I, I've done Uber as well. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I've seen some of your stuff. Before. Yeah. Yeah. I miss, uh, I miss elements of it. Uh, when, when I have my vaccine, you know, and I'm not going to be the first in line to get the vaccine. Trust me. So Ain't nobody uh, can be first in line. Don't worry about that. Yeah. But uh, when I get my vaccine on the second wave, you know, you I'll start Ubering on the way home and on the way back. I kind of miss it, um, you know, because I, I love people. So I miss the, um, you know, I miss the, the back and forth with Uber. But uh, yeah, I quit around the same time. Uh, well, probably I quit in April of last year. I mean, of this year. So yeah, yeah. It so it seems like last year at this point. <laughs> it does. It does. It feels like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say you know, not, yeah. I mean, we could probably. I'm sure we could probably you know go back and forth with like funny Uber stories. You know, I said one day I should probably write a book or podcast on it, but you know, I will tell one of my funny ones if I can. So this was a New Year's Eve, you know, so you can, <laughs> oh, all, you all, can already imagine does. this involved a little bit of, you know, somebody not being uh, alcoholically disciplined. Um, <laughs> so we get, you know, a couple, I mean, thank God the one girl had kind of more control, but this one girl was in my car. She had been having fun. We'll just say, believe it at that. But first I pull out and she's like, look out for the ostriches. I'm like, what? And she's like, they have feathers on their boots. They're ostriches. I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. Oh, the whole ride home, Tony, she kept calling me different names like every five minutes. She's like, hey, Stephen. I'm like, my name's Evan. Oh, sorry. Hey, Philip. I'm like, my name's Evan. Like literally every five minutes, she kept calling me a different name. It was so hilarious. <laughs> oh man it was it was fun though yeah. so yeah the, a little uber fun i'm sure i live, I live vicariously it. through these stories i i enjoy hearing what what he what he experiences when he's doing that so yeah. oh yeah well i might not be able to come back because i messed around and showed kim one of those youtube videos of all the bad things that happened to uber oh, drivers gosh. oh so gosh saw yeah. that, she was like i don't know if i want you going back i said well if i go back i'm gonna be going during you know uh, one time in the morning and one time on the way home. So there you so, go. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it won't be the same as driving on weekends and everything else. So, what was the hardest part about becoming financially disciplined? <laughs> now I'm sure it was maybe different things for different, different, different folks. Yeah. Uh, so I think for me there were two things that were really hard, and the first part was. When we so for those who are not familiar with Financial Peace University, right, it is it is a course, right? It's a nine week class that you take. And when we first started the class, Evan and I were not married. We were engaged at that point. And in the second week of the class, they ask you, well, between the first and second week, they ask you to go home and calculate all your debt. Mm. And they give you this little card to fill out, like how many open credit, well, how much debt do you have, right? Down to the penny, right? Number one, how many open credit card accounts do you have? And how much money do you currently have in savings at that moment, right? Those are the three big questions that they ask you. And I have to be honest that I had not sat down and calculated my student loan debt, mm -hmm. right? Like I knew I had debt on my car and I had a couple open credit cards at the time. And I, but I knew what those balances were. Yeah, um, I but, and I had a couple of medical bills as well. I didn't know though what the student loan, like the actual student loan debt was because I wasn't paying it at the time. So there was no reason to know, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I had to like log into the system and figure it out. 
And when I put all of that together, that starting number for me started with a three. Wow. Wow. It wasn't 30. And it wasn't 30, right? <laughs> three digit number that started with a three. Wow. No, six digit number that started with a three. And wow. I and so um it was it was heartbreaking, right? Because I didn't know. And then I got heartbroken all over again because I realized that I had to walk into this space and tell him because he didn't know. Right. And so I had to, I, I, the, on my way to church, to this class, I'm on the phone with my mother crying. Mm -hmm. He's going to, he's going to break up with me. Right. Like this is a deal breaker. Like if I was walking into this, this would be a deal breaker. Who's going to tie their, (laughs) their wagon to this woman with all this like debt. Right. Is what I'm thinking. My mom said, baby, just pray. Right. He loves you. Right. And this is not this is not going to be a deal breaker. You have to walk in. And so, I mean, the whole class, I'm like sweating and like, oh, when are we going to get to the point of having to do this? And I remember sliding. So we traded cards. Right. So I could see his card. He could see my card. This dude. Right. <laughs> how how much how much debt do you have? What was the number, Evan? <laughs> and I was like. For real, God, really, <laughs> this is what we're doing. And yeah, so, she was kind of hoping, like, okay, maybe I, was I had. Maybe he would have some debt, so, so like, it wouldn't be so bad. And um, he saw my card, and I'm telling you, his eyes got like. But, <laughs> but he looked at me at that moment, and he said, "We can do this." Yeah. Right. We can do this, and I knew. I was like, "It's time for Tony's golden nugget." Okay, so that was my biggest thing: was getting over the hurdle. Sure. I'm having to be honest, right, of exactly how much money I owed. And I think, too, the other biggest part of being disciplined was having to give up that instantaneous gratification piece, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah. ooh, I like that. Go buy it. Ooh, I think. Go buy it. There was, there, there, there was none of that, right? Because right? it was like, I can't afford it. Right. Everything became, I can't afford it. I just can't afford it. And so those, those I think, were the two biggest hurdles for me. Sure. You know, it's amazing you said that because my wife and I, uh, who are a not-for-profit organization, we've used the same source material, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Ramsey books, to try to help people. Mm-hmm. And each time that we tried to help someone who was in extreme debt, just getting them to come clean with themselves about how much money they owe was a tough part. It was a it was a rough part. And yeah. it's amazing how many people are in debt and they don't know how much they owe. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing that yeah. uh, and, and it's hard to get folk because we've helped people in this. I promise you, this has happened more than once where we say, OK, is this all your debt? And then they, they think about it and they're like, oh, wait a minute. And then they, 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 they pull another bill out of somewhere and they're like, oh, here's, wrong. Another- <laughs> and here's the thing. I'm glad you said that. I was wrong about the student loan calculation. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that until what we were almost a year into the process, I think. Um, before I before I figured out that I had actually. No, we were multiple years. In the process. OK, yeah, that I had calculated wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What happened was, you know, like. She had, you know, said, okay, this is what we owe on student loans. And then one day, you know, she was saying we weren't making progress on it. And this was kind of a tough point, but this was another. And here's the thing. If you're walking through this, you know, another thing in discipline, you're going to have setbacks and misunderstandings. You just got to find ways to keep plowing and readjust. And, you know, and there is emotion to it, too, you know, and that's very real. But I remember we I finally logged in the portal, you know, because I was kind of like, okay, you know, you deal with that. We'll make the budget. You make the payment. And then I'm like. I went and looked in. I'm like, there's another hundred thousand you owe. She's like, no, that's consolidated. I'm like, yeah, that means it's all in one pot. That doesn't mean it disappeared. <laughs> oh. oh, so, you know, yeah. I, I mean, again, but a lot of, you know, and I, I don't judge on that. I mean, granted, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that wasn't tough at the time, but I think just, you know, being disciplined, um, you know, the, t- the toughest thing too, I think is the emotion of it. I think that's why like a lot of people don't deal with it is because it not, you know, it's the whole out of sight, out of mind. If I don't deal with it, if I just pay the minimum payments and let, you know, or just pay payments as long as I keep collectors off my back and can live however I want and keep charging things and keep getting lines of credit, 
if I can ignore it long enough, I don't really have to face the fact that, you know, I have a negative net worth, you know, that I have more in debt that I owe banks and lenders than I have actual cash in hand. So I think that's a, that's a tough part of it is a lot of people don't want to face it. And because it, you know, it is ugly. I know there's a lot of times where, you know, we have, you know, especially I know for her as a woman where it's, it's tough. To, I have to watch even how I talk about it. Cause I can be very matter of fact, push, let's get to the goal. But sometimes my push to get to the goal can almost be hurtful to her because she's feeling the emotion and the shame of it. And the like, you know, be disciplined, subscribe now. I can't believe I messed up. I don't want to face this at this moment because I'm feeling weak. Other things are going on. So the emotion of it is is very real. You know what I mean? It's not just money. I mean, finance touches every area of life because you think about, you know, decisions that you made to get there. You think about the fact that, you know, for her, it was like, hey, my parents didn't set me up in a good way. You know what I mean? I had to take out debt because, you know, um, I had to drop out of school for a point for my dad to go to rehab. I had to, you know, I didn't, I didn't know this. I didn't, you know, we went through this. So, you know, it's, it's almost sometimes reconfronting those things. There might be, you know, for a lot of people, there might be an ugly divorce that is at the, you know, I have, you know, friends and, you know, going through that kind of stuff right now where it's like an ugly divorce where they're getting the short end of the stick from it, you know what I mean? And having to bounce back from that, or, you know, maybe it was something that happened to you that was no fault of yours. Right. You were abused. You were left on right. your own. You were, you know, you have health challenges, you have health right? Challenges. Like that's another big one for people. You got, you ran yeah. into a bad boss at work that didn't like you for whatever reason, just kicked you to the curb and set you back years, you know? So all those things can, I think there's emotion, which makes it tough. And then I think too, just the, keeping up with the Joneses kind of on the emotion, the other side of the emotional coin is like the, you know, looking around, you know, kind of, I think we all do the comparison thing to a different extent as humans, um, you know, cause we're trying to all figure it out. So looking around, seeing, especially uh, the job I was at before this current one, you know, I worked in downtown Pittsburgh at a bank. I worked with a lot of people who were doing well and, you know, I'm kind of looking at people my age and younger that are, you know, making this money, going out, doing these things. And, you know, I don't see what's behind the curtain, but I'm like, should I be quote unquote further? And again, I don't know if they're further because they might have the negative net worth behind that. But regardless, I think that can be tough. That get Again, that's instant gratification too. You know, like I want to look like what they are looking like now. I want to live where they're living now. I want to eat at the restaurants they're eating at now, live the lifestyle they're living now, you know, be the person, you know, that they're carrying, you know, the ace of spades or whatever across the room for now. I want to be that now. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's funny that you mentioned the thing. I, I have to tell this story just for context, because I think it will help some people. It, this was, I don't know, maybe three years ago now. Um, for birthday when we went to dinner at um, what was it? Pin? What was the what was the restaurant? Oh no, that was our wedding anniversary. The Capitol Grill. Yeah, we decided a couple of years ago that we were going to go to the Capitol Grill for our wedding. Anniversary. Nicer, nicer restaurant. Basically. If anybody's ever been to the Capitol Grill, like to walk in the door feels like it should cost you a hundred dollars. Like it's literally that ridiculously expensive and so you know here we are we're all dressed up in our best gear and we're going downtown and, and we saved thing. up for it and put we it in the budget and, paid cash. and put it in our budget to pay cash for it we did um but can i tell you that we sat there and we had that meal and we had a wonderful time and it was a great celebration but i remember when we got in the car we looked at each other and we were like we will never do anything like that again Amen. until we're debt free. Amen. Because Amen. it didn't, I mean, I'm not saying that it wasn't a great experience, but I could have went to Bob Evans with him and had <laughs> just, just as a great experience for a tenth of what yeah. that meal cost us. Right. But I think that there was something about that experience that was like, I don't want to say that we, I didn't feel like we earned it, but the next time that I was in that room, I didn't want to feel like I had to work super hard to make this happen. Sure. Right. Um, and I didn't have to regret it later. Like, I think that that's the thing too, like, you know, sitting there thinking like, you know, how many people are just dropping their credit cards to pay for this meal mm -hmm. and how many times this month have they done that? Yeah. Right. 
And so you're still going to be paying for that meal two, three years from now when I'm done. I paid for it one time, you know, and it's over and, I, and I'm not going to do that again. And so, yeah, I think that that's part of that process of just kind of learning that discipline. Now I'll say, I think a lot of people ask us a lot. So it's like, oh, you guys must never go anywhere. You must never do anything. We have a great life, yeah. right? Like I don't want people to think that we're just like sleeping on the floor and like eating instant mashed potatoes and like not, we, we eat well, right? We are well taken care of, you know, our, our, you know, we have furniture in our house, right? It's like, yeah. we're not at a, we're not at a level of a deficit where we, we are not um, thriving, Absolutely. right? But what we're not doing is living beyond the means of what we make. Um, I, just for purposes so that everybody knows, Evan and I both work full time and we both have side hustles, but on paper, we live on one salary. Awesome. That is awesome. Right. And and it has to be that way, because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be on the other side of one hundred and ninety five thousand dollars worth of debt paid off in six years. Cool. Like if you do the math of that, it's basically a salary a year mm -hmm. that we have paid to 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 the debt. You ha and you have to live that way. Like that's that sacrifice piece, right? Yeah. And 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 I'm not saying it's easy because Lord knows it is not easy. Sometimes it is really really hard, right? But it's worth it yeah. because every single time we pay something off, mm -hmm. it's like whew, it's one less thing, right? That I have to worry about or one less thing that I have to be concerned about. Or now, if somebody gets sick. And we have to go to the doctor. We're not scrambling trying to figure out how we're going to pay for it. Right. Like I remember a time when I had to like scrape change to put gas in my car. Mm. I haven't had to do that. And I don't even have to look at my bank account before I go pump gas. Like that to me is a miracle. Well, now we it, both work from home. Let's pump right. gas. We're not <laughs> pumping gas right now. But I mean, prior to the pandemic, right? Like when yeah. I need to put gas in my car, I just roll up and put gas in my car. I remember the time when I had to like, look at my bank account or look at the calendar and be like, well, I don't get paid for another two days. I better make sure I have this, you know, quarter of a tank of gas last for as long as it, uh, it, it can. Right. And so I think that, you know, those sacrifices have just paid off in places yeah. in our lives where, um, you know, you, there's no, you can't put a price tag on that. Amen. Amen. Now, um, and I, I, I'm going to place a, I have a thing where I place my daughter in the thing that says Tony's golden nugget. So uh, what we're going to, where I think I'm going to place a golden nugget and, and maybe we, you know, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can agree or disagree or whatever, but I, I hear a golden nugget here um, that I have for, at least for my physical diet, I have a reward day where, and the reward days kind of help, you know, I do six days, very strict. And then I have one day where I still stick to a four hour eating window, but then within that four hour win window, I can eat carbs or I can eat sweet things. Right. And I think even within a budget, when y'all were talking about that you went to Capitol Gr Grill, but then you still, it was in the budget. Yeah. yeah. You had that as a reward. Yeah. And, and, and just for our listeners, I think it's time for Tony's Golden Nugget. I think it's important, whether it's financial discipline or uh, a, a diet, a physical diet. Um, I think you need to budget in reward days. Absolutely. And then like those it. reward days have to be very strategic and you have to be disciplined about getting in the reward day and getting out the out reward day. Out of it, day. exactly. Yeah. Because you can't exactly. let the re reward day extend out past the, the prescribed time. Yeah. Uh, because if you're if you're not careful, the reward day can get bigger and bigger and bigger. It sure can. And bigger. It sure can. I mean, and and I think that that's the beauty, right, of of the of of the Ramsey plan, right? Because there is a piece where you can build in um, sinking funds, right, where you can save for things over time. Um, that would be a way to do a reward. But then, you know, we each kind of have what we call our quote unquote fun money, yeah, right? Like that's another, that. it's another yeah. big thing with, with the, with the Ramsey piece and every family can define for them what fun money looks like. So Evan and I have from the beginning said each one of us get a hundred dollars, right? A mm -hmm. month. That's your fun money. However you choose to 
spend it is how you choose to spend it. So you can blow all your fun money in one day yep. if you want to, or you can stretch your fun money out over time, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can be like I do, which is I save my fun money for like long periods of time and then I splurge. Yeah. So when he so when he sees like Amazon boxes come, he's like, yeah. oh, you've been saving again. Oh, uh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Right? But, like, because, it, you know, you just do it as you need you know, to. That's how we do. And I think that's a good hack for uh, married couples too with financial discipline is you definitely do your budget together, have your accounts together, but then have your, you know, so how we do ours is, you know, our paychecks hit our individual accounts we move like most of it to a joint account that's for the budget. But then we like, like Erica said, keep that fun money because here's the nice thing about that is that avoids the, like, you know, every time you spend $5, you know, like if you're going home and you want to get a Slurpee and a piece of pizza, you know, and you're like, you spent $5 on a piece of pizza. It gives that little bit, like if she wants to spend clothes out of her fun money, cool. It's budgeted for, it's taken care of. Like right. it gives that little bit of freedom, like you said, and reward, but then also like, you know, in exchange for that, the boundary is, you know, we discuss if I'm going to take something out of like the restaurant budget or the gas budget, or if I say, hey, I want this, but I don't have fun money, like then it becomes a discussion, you know, so, right. um, you know, it's like you don't discuss every little thing it gives you that boundary, but then it also, you know, keeps the boundary too. So you're not cutting into because you do have to, I mean, I like what Dave Ramsey says about a budget that, you know, budget is permission to spend. You tell your money where to go. A budget is not a restriction tool that is like, you never get to have any fun. It's like when you set it up, it's almost like setting up a schedule. Like if you've ever showed up for an event that's unorganized, which, you know, I've done hip hop, you know, in both the Christian and secular worlds. And, you know, I've gone to events and I, I generally find events like, you know, I've been to Flavor Fest, which was very organized, like runs on time starts on time artists are stick to their time it keeps it moving they have hosts you know and it's fun because there is organization to it right. and i've been to battle rap events I won't name league names, where it's like guys are standing around smoking they start two three hours late <laughs> they take drink breaks between and it's like so unorganized it's like there's no flow to it you know right. what i mean it's like you think there's freedom in unorganization but there's really not like yeah. there's actually more freedom in organization then there is not you pay you're, you're gonna pay the price somewhere so you better pay the price up front have it organized then just roll it out rather than scramble and try to you know make a make something out of chaos yeah. now on this journey have y'all had a chance to meet dave uh dave ramsey not or? yet but we okay. so we've determined that we are gonna go to tennessee um to do so for people who are familiar dave does what's called a debt-free screen Sure. So when you are finished with your consumer debt, you can apply to have your debt free scream on Dave's show. And mm -hmm. so we plan to apply um, and we will we plan to go to Tennessee in person. Um, I just need to hug him. <laughs> I need to I need to personally hug him and thank him because he has changed my life. Sure. Right. Sure, sure. Um, and and I feel like. Um, he, I mean, I think he hears this constantly, right? When people are always like, thank you so much for what you've done. But um, I am going to put a, I, I will put a little caveat here. Um, uh, my introduction to the Ramsey program, right, was from a very narrow window, right? So at the time, um, the people who worked, most of the people who worked for Dave were Caucasian, right? Um, and he was just starting to kind of grow and shift his um, his staff to be more diverse. And I think what is starting to happen is that more diverse communities are starting to hear about the Ramsey program and starting to utilize the Ramsey program. And so for me, I see it as just a way to encourage, you know, more African American people or Hispanic people or Asian people or any other person who is not Caucasian to say, hey, this is not a quote unquote white people thing. Right. right? Because I have heard people say that to me, like, oh, that's who does that, right? Like white people are the only people who do that. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like it's not that's not it's not a thing. I under, I understand that it's not common right in a lot of communities of color and go back to my statement at the beginning right no one in my household had financial discipline cool. at all period 
we were hand to mouth. Right. That's how we always lived, right? right? And I'm not saying that that is a bad thing. When you have to do that, that is that you are you are surviving, and I understand that. But I think that there's something to be said about what would it look like, right? To be able to create a new context or a new opportunity for your family. Like if you as a, a person of color could change your financial stead and then raise your children in a household where they never have to think about money as a hand to mouth situation, that they understand how to save, that they understand how to be conservative, that they understand how to be frugal, but they also still understand that it's okay to have fun. Absolutely. They just understand the value of money, yeah. right? And and how important it is. Like it would be so cool to raise a kid to to say, I didn't have my mom may have had to struggle. My grandparents, right, may have had to struggle, but I've never had to I've never had to struggle. Um for me, it's one of the biggest goals that I have, right, at the end of this, because step seven in the Ramsey solution is to give. Right. So once you get to a point where you're out of debt and you're, you know, you are giving that money away. We if, if we've learned how to live on one salary now, we will learn how to live on one salary in the future. And instead of giving that money to debt collectors, we'll be able to give it to people. Right. Who will be able to change their lives. Yeah. And so my goal is to start a scholarship fund for students. So that no student ever has to make the decision that I had to make to either drop out of school because you can't afford to be there or to have to take out so much um, extra debt in order to be able to afford school. And so, you know, students who are working hard, who have a strong, you know, um, um, ability to achieve and but they have a deficit. I just want to be that angel investor that shows up in the bursar's office and writes a check. And Amen. they don't know how their debt got paid, but it got paid. Amen. Amen. Right? Um, because I think that that is so important um, to to be able to do that. I, I am blessed to be in the position that I'm in. I'm going to be blessed to be in that position to be debt free. And I don't want someone else to have to walk through the, you know, walk through the struggle that I've, that I've walked through. So, Sweet. yeah. Well, I'm going to very yeah. unpopular. I'm taking the, uh, the Ramsey course and putting it into my church. So, um, you know, I'm taking the principles from the book and putting it into my church and letting yeah. them know that we've been taught that the love of money is the root of all evil on one hand. And then so for that reason, there's some people whenever you bring up money, you, you're you like you're you're not being spiritual, but then right. don't understand the concept of an Ecclesiastes where money moves all things, that money is part of our life. Money, yeah. you don't, you're not supposed to love it. You're not supposed to let it own you. But it's a part of our life that if we don't manage we're going to struggle. The Bible talks about stewardship over yes, and over, absolutely. over for a reason. Now, yes. what I do here's I'm, I do something sneaky because I know that sometimes Dave can get off on one of his political rants. So what I do is I always stay. I always share Chris Hogan a lot, you know, yes. to, to reach my folks. You know, because yes. he's like the lovable, more uh, he's like the 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 sweeter teddy version. Of he's a teddy bear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So I love both of them, but I share Chris because he's like the, at least for my community, I feel like he's the more, like, like, like the folks will like Chris more, you know, so, yeah. so yeah. But I love both of them. I yeah. love both. Yeah, I think. And, that. and um, I can't remember the, the new guy's name who is working with college students Anthony specifically. Yeah, he's Anthony another African American gentleman. He has um, a book called Debt Free Degree. So, but I know he was also, you know. Very out, and Dave actually had him on talking about like you know when George Floyd happened and issues that people of color faced, and you know he was very upfront about it, and you know was very much you know he wasn't he wasn't doing the kind of you know conservative song and dance, but he was speaking on it very truthfully and very biblically and justice minded. But you know he does he does a lot on like you know how to go to college without debt, you know what I mean? Scholarships, you know, saving, preparing, all those different working, kind of things, working. Right? Yeah. So um. Yeah, I think that's great that, you know, there's, and I think that's good they're building those different, you know, faces, because here's the thing, the principles work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you need to see, if your community needs to see Chris Hogan's face on it, as opposed to Dave's for it to work, or his Dave's daughter, you know, if it's a community of women that need to see Dave's daughter instead of Dave for it to work, right. cool, or see Anthony O'Neill if it's younger people, 
that's, you know, my thing is the principles work. And, you know, yeah. I, I wanted to share two quick things that'll probably feed into other questions and we can unpack more. But I think, you know, I was kind of thinking from a high level as we're talking, like, really, like Erica said, you know, when she brought up about baby step seven, like, I feel like that's the whole goal to financial discipline is to get us that, you know, everybody's been, you know, you look at the parable of the talents, everybody's been given different talents. And, you know, Jesus never said, you know, you're wicked because you don't produce. He didn't tell the guy with five, you're wicked because you didn't produce 10. You right. produced according to what you had and you're good. You know what I mean? So, I, you know, not everybody's going to have the same level of wealth, but I think those who do have a lot, you know, a lot's required of that. And, you know, if everybody's being financially disciplined, those who have a lot can be able to give to help some people who, because I do understand there are people who would probably listen to this and hear financial principles and think like, you know, I'm a single mom with three kids barely making it, or, you know, I had this, this, and this happen and I'm on limited income, you know what I mean? So there, you know, but if you have people that are building wealth that are able to help people and give them hands up, you know, and give them boosts in different ways, I think that's where building to that step seven of giving is really essential. And then, you know, I think, yeah, I just think that's kind of the whole key to it. And another thing I wanted to say, and this might come up in other questions is, you know, I asked the question a lot with like COVID and the shutdowns, like, how would this look if we as a society had been practicing this? If general rule in society was you get out of consumer debt and you save up three to six months of savings, how would these COVID shutdowns look different for us as a society? How could we pivot to new industries differently? Mm -hmm. Amen. Not only on the financial side of discipline, but I, I have to look at myself as a guy who's carry, who carries too much weight, that if I had been intermittent fasting before all of this hit, and if I had discovered intermittent fasting before all of this hit, then my immunities would be higher as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how many people have we lost because maybe we weren't eating right or we yes. were eating out? Yes. You know, yes. so it's not just the financial discipline, but it's also physically, you know, yes. a lot of the reasons why people pass is because of their immunity levels, yes. you know, so their immunity systems being compromised because of lifestyle decisions. Not yes. all the time, but sometimes, yes. you know. I mean, I, I think the other thing is too that we are, we're struggling with, and I say this because I work in a community of young people who are really struggling emotionally with, with COVID, right? And it's because their lifestyle prior to quarantine allowed them to block out all of the things that made them feel anxious or bad or emotional. So they could party, they could drink, they could travel, they could do all these things, right? To not have to worry about the life stuff creeping in but now that everybody's at home right and you're not going out as much or those life things are creeping in and 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 students are saying things like i'm anxious i'm not sleeping i'm not i'm not eating well i'm not doing all these things and it's because like you said we didn't discipline ourselves in those areas mm -hmm. prior to the the restriction right um as a kid who so um i was born with um a form of cerebral palsy called uh, spastic diplegia. So I have um, congenital hip issues. And so as a kid, I had to do a lot of treatments and, and different things. And so I spent a lot of summer vacations at home, right? Like because I was in, in a cast or, you know, going to therapy regularly. So I wasn't really going out and doing a lot of things. Um, and so I joke a lot of times with my friends that I was built for quarantine. <laughs> right like somebody said oh you don't you can't go anywhere for three months cool that was seventh grade right like i'm good <laughs> give me a book i'm watching some netflix you know you know play, cooking playing some video games doing whatever but i but i understand that not every person right is able to sit alone with themselves and their own thoughts and their own emotions. And, and I will tell you, I'm generally a pretty even killed person. And some of this has pushed me to like, look, this is a little too much, even right. for me, right? <laughs> and so I can only imagine for other people where that struggle is. So I think that's a great point, Tony, right? That, that some of this is building discipline before, right? the the situation and and when i put the post up about you know um a, a, about where we had walked through that increase in income during this pandemic was because we had built the discipline for that 
prior to the pandemic. Yeah. It wasn't, and, and, and that God blessed us immensely during this time, but we had built the discipline for that. We had said, you know, we're, we are willing to, you know, um, work in certain areas or consult in certain areas. I had been working on some other projects with other folks prior to the, the pandemic. So when this opportunity opened itself, right. Um, and, and it was a, like an introduction, like, let me introduce you to introduce you to someone else. And I got this opportunity. I was like, yeah, sure. This would be great. And, and I accepted the opportunity before they even told me, right. How much, how much money I would make. And then when we talked about the contract, I was like, wait, what? What's <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. Like, mm-hmm. because um, I, I knew, right. Like uh, I have the time. I think about it like God put me in a position that, that he knew that this project was going to come around during this time. And he put me in a place where I was just going to have the free time in order to be able to do what they need to be done on a data coalition side for this for this project to take place. And so, yeah, building that discipline ahead of time is such a it's, it's really such a great it's really such a great place to be here. Here is, I think, the the hard part, right, is um, like we talked about earlier, people dealing with the emotion of this. I don't want people to think that you are going to come to the discipline of this in a vacuum. There Mm. are times when Evan is very strong and I am very weak and vice versa. Yeah. Right. Like there are times when he's just like, let's get it. Like we're out here and I'm just like, okay, sure. Right. Like I'm just, I'm trudging along, but like, I'm still moving. I might not be moving as fast as he is, but there are some times when I outpace him. Right. And Mm -hmm. he's trying to catch up to to keep up with me. I remember a couple of years ago when we were in a job transition moment and he was unemployed for a short period of time. And, um, Oh God, it feels like forever ago. (laughs) I keep talking like we're talking like years ago. It was last year, but he was, he was unemployed and, um, you know, God opened up an opportunity for us with the, with the jewelry business. And we were able to earn a pay, like his entire paycheck. Yeah. Like a half month paycheck, a, a job in like a four day weekend, you know? Because, you know, she worked the jewelry show. It was like right before Mother's Day. So, you know, we did well there. And then like when during kind of the slower times or when she had coverage, I got an Uber locally. So I do like an Uber route, make some money because we were close to the airport, too. So it's like, you know, it just I mean, it just worked out. Right. So I, I think that I want people to understand that this is not that straight line A to Z kind of thing. It's going to be like this and sometimes yeah. it's going to be tied in a bow and sometimes it's going to be rough. Right. But, um, yeah, you, it, it is, um, it's, it's important. One other thing, um, somebody, you, somebody mentioned about single moms at some point, And then Weird. it made me think about this. I will say this. Time for Tony's Golden Nugget. If you are a single person who's going to choose to do this. You need an accountability partner. For sure. You cannot do this by yourself. I I would have given up a long time ago trying to do this by myself, right? Like, thank God for my husband. And even us as a couple, we have accountability people that we go to on a regular basis, right? To talk about our, we're, we are financial coaches and we have a financial coach. Yeah. Right. Cause you, you just need that. You need someone to go to. So Make sure you have a good accountability partner. Sorry, yeah. I know we're like all off. Yeah, yeah. So my dad. Let me share a point uh, because as I was introducing the Ramsey principles to my church, um, there was a single mom who came back to me and said, well, "You know, Tonya, I don't. You talk about six months, saving six months' salary for an emergency fund. You know, Tonya, you know, I don't see how I can do. You know, and I, I, I want to share for anyone listening today, uh, two store, two quick stories. Uh, my wife and I were in a larger church and a brother came to me who needed some help. Uh, He needed to drive one of my vehicles uh, back and forth to work um, because he couldn't get his sports car out of the shop. Okay. He couldn't, you know, I won't say the name of the sports car because then the church would know who I'm talking about, but, but, but he, he couldn't get his expensive sports car out of the shop. Him and his wife made 
well over $140,000 a year. Okay. And he couldn't get his vehicle out of the shop. And he so he had to drive like my Kia Sportage for several weeks in order, you know, until, and I gave him the, Dan, the, the Dave Ramsey book. And, you know, he changed his life around, I believe, by faith. Uh, he changed his life life around. Now, let me just contrast that to the other story. My wife and I were helping a, um, an older woman move one time. And she was, she had been living by herself for five to ten years. Now, don't get me wrong, she shouldn't have done this. But I opened, we opened a drawer of her, of her dress, you know, her area, of her, of her bedroom. And she had like 20 grand in, you know, in the drawer of saved up money. Mm -hmm. So, so even though that second person didn't necessarily have the Dave Ramsey book, she had the, she had many, not all, but, you know, cause it should have been accumulating interest, but, but, uh, but she still had some of the principles oh, yeah. of, of knowing how to save your money and live below your means. So I just share that for anyone listening to to emphasize and draw down the point that it doesn't make a difference how much money you make. It's how well you manage it. Yes. Oh, that, yeah. yes. yes. That is so, it, that's the whole thing. That right. That is the whole idea behind this process. And I think like in the last year, um, Ramsey Solutions has done an amazing job to kind of try to change the function of the curriculum to no longer make Dave the center, right? Mm -hmm. I think they have enough success stories of people from all over the map that they've turned it out now to say, don't take Dave's word for it. Like, listen to all these regular everyday people, mm -hmm. right, who have done this program and who have changed their lives. And so in the new iteration of the curriculum, every week is another testimony, right, of another person who took the class or read the book or something happened that they were introduced to the principles and they've changed their lives. And the and the 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 um the one of the people that sticks out to me the most was this was this single woman um in Chicago, right? She was she was like a PR consultant and you know just living that lifestyle right like when you work in industries like marketing and pr like everything around you is flash right. right so it's like what i wear what i drive where i live what i do all of that matters and she was like i had nothing to show she's like i woke up one day and realized that i had nothing but stuff right mm. to show for what i had done and she like completely turned her life around and you know paid off all of her consumer debt and she was like and I actually, you know, she moved to a smaller place, right? Like she, she made a lot of concessions, right? In order to be able to do what she, she was, was she the one that she said, like, didn't even have like furniture for like a limited time. Yeah. Like, she was like, there was like, a you know, few, like a couple friends months were in like, there. How do you have no couches in your place? And, <laughs> she's you know, like, I'm working on it. I'm working like, on it. Right. Like, out. but it was, it was just, it was really interesting because you could see that, like you said, it's not about how much money you have about what you accomplish. It's how you manage that money or even how you think about your money right like i that's that's a that those are all really big yeah those are all really big things amen now what are areas that you all would consider uh areas that are weak points when it comes to the broad because we talk about discipline here about spirituality mental physical emotional finance uh, uh time organization home organization and data organization what would you consider your undeveloped areas? Um, I'll start on that. I think I think physically, I could I say I'm inconsistently physically disciplined. You know, I kind of go through my and I'm I'm a recovering fat kid. You know, so I like <laughs> sweets and fats. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. You know? I, see, I knew I liked you, man. You, you, you like me. You got the you got the bald and beard thing going on. You know, it's like you know. Um, so yeah, I think physical is one, and then home. I think I can be a little bit just because I'm not like. You know, I'm kind of like, hey, I'll get to it. Oh, you know, I kind of do put things off and procrastinate on the home front sometimes and are not always, you know, like, you know, she's always like, make sure you put the dog's toys away at night. Make sure you put this here. I'm like, just leave them. They're fine. I, I, I want to go to bed. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I think I think I could get better on those two areas. Sure. Yeah, I would say for me, I think physical is my biggest discipline area, right, that I'm that I am still attempting to try to kind of learn and 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 grow with um 
you know, I, given my physical limitations, I've always tried to find that balance of, you know, controlling my weight, right? Because I know that the, the healthier my body is, the less in pain, right, that I would be overall. But then also kind of dealing with that, like, Evan said, like that inner fat kid that's just like, I'm just going to eat the cheesecake, right? Like, it's going to make me feel so good. Um, so, you know, figuring figuring those things out for me is, is, is pretty interesting. I will say that I am highly organized on the, like the data organization and the home organization side, but I think to the point where sometimes it can be a little bit much, right? So I'm learning to try to pull back a little bit in those areas because he can tell you I would be the one where I'm like exhausted but I'm still like I, but I got to clean the kitchen and start the dishwasher and straighten up the living room and do all those things before I go to bed right and so that is an extra 40 minutes or an hour of sleep that I'm depriving myself because I'm so driven by this thing right like needing to be needing to be perfect so I'm 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 learning to to not live on the extremes yeah right of of those things and really kind of trying to find good balance amen 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 well i have the same weak area uh question though do you have a plan to help strengthen that weak area or if you do do you feel like sharing it with our audience um yeah i think it's one of those you know we're, we're kind of working on it, I'd say, in development. You know, I know one of the questions, I might jump ahead a little bit here in, you know, but I think you had said, you know, what you sent me about, like, do you believe in the strength, you know, using strengths and not focusing on weaknesses or developing weaknesses? Um, I'm a I'm a Gallup guy, so I'm definitely like a big, I'm a, you know, not a certified strength coach, but I do a lot of it in my day job. So I definitely believe on kind of focusing primarily on strengths and using those, but I kind of, I don't believe in ignoring weaknesses. I believe in setting up systems. Like I, I don't believe in focusing on weaknesses so much because I think if you, all you do is focus on trying to fix your weaknesses, you're just going to deprive yourself. I believe in setting up systems in order that your weaknesses don't trip you up and you can use strength. So for instance, at work, I'll use this example. I work, my boss is very much like, like on the disc, see, I'm a very IS personality. So I'm very people outgoing, persuasive. Um, you know, she, my boss is a very SC personality. So she's very detailed data, like, you know, a lot of questions, get things down, compliance. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll use that partnership to kind of run things by her and show things, show her how I have things set up and just let her kind of stress test things from a compliance and organization standpoint so that that way I have a tool that I know I can use to kind of keep me organized because I'm not naturally good at that. And I think with discipline, that's one of those things like for those weaker points, you know, where, where we'd have to go is like kind of look at the strengths, like, okay, what works well for us on the financial side or lifestyle side that we can apply? You know, again, I don't believe in overly looking at it, but you really want to operate in your strengths as much as you can, but then, you know, kind of find ways to, you manage weaknesses, you know what I mean? You don't ignore them, but you don't over-focus. Like you're never going to turn your weakness into a strength, I believe necessarily, but what you can do is you can find ways to manage it so that it doesn't become your Achilles heel and make you fall on your face either. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will say that I do have a plan um, in place to, um, you know, ad address my, uh, my weakness. And I, like, I, I think this year was big for me, like, you know, well, going to the doctor, I think probably for everybody this year, like going to the doctor was like the big outings because no one was doing anything. So it was like, Ooh, doctor's appointment. And so <laughs> I remember when I went for my yearly physical and I, you know, was talking to my PCP about my concern, right. About my weight, because I have yo-yoed in my weight over and over again, probably for like the last eight or nine years, I keep gaining and losing the same 20 ish pounds over and over again. Right. And, and I said to her, I was like, how do we finally get to a point of stopping the yo-yo? Right. And she said to me, you worry too much about the number on the scale. Mm. And I need you to be concerned about how you feel. Mm. No. So our, so our goal this year is only to measure things by how I feel. Oh. If I don't feel well, right, 
then I know that there are some changes that need to be made. But if I feel strong, right, if I feel if I'm sleeping well, if I'm, you know, if if I am finding, you know, balance and I'm not struggling with anger or I'm not, you know, like all these different things, right, that she was saying, like, you know, she's like, think about it when you take in food, you need to ask yourself, how does that food make me feel? Mm. Right? Like if you eat something and you get a headache, right. you might need to stop eating that particular thing. Right, right, right. right. And that that has nothing to do with getting on a scale every week or, you know, it's just gauging it by how I feel. And she said, I'm telling you, if you become more mindful, right, about how your body feels, that number on the scale will change. Wow. Incidentally, it's just going to happen. And so that's the approach, right, that I that I plan to take. Um, in this year is really just listening to my body and really trying to understand um, where my body is is going with that. And, you know, I know she mentioned too, like, that's why a lot of people are turning to things like intermittent fasting, right? Because it's really allowing you to, to have, a, be more in tune, sure. right? With, with your body sure. and really understanding how your body operates. And so, yeah, that's, that's my plan. So we'll have to reconvene this time next year to I'll I'll say this for our listeners is that uh, the approach that Erica just shared is actually the more disciplined approach because Mm -hmm. gauging and staying on top of your emotional well-being, um, you really have to you have to stay calm. You have to stay alert in order for that to work, you know, because it's so easy to unconsciously be feeling bad and eating bad and not even thinking about it. Right. You know, so you have, so it takes a, a level of alertness and a level, a level of discipline, emotional discipline. Uh, Cause what I've realized is when you're feeling, when I'm feeling bad, I'm eating bad. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so, you know, and that's why I always say, you know, when I make my post, I've been a hundred days on the wagon because I have not been, uh, you know, I, I've not allowed my emotions to hijack me for the last hundred days. That's awesome. Well, what advice do you have for people who are seeking discipline, both of you? Um, good, very good question. Oh, wow. I'm um, as far as advice, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is something that my pastor said is, you know, when you don't know what to do, just do the next right thing. So I think sometimes, like you know, to keep it on the financial side, since we've been talking about. This whole thing, kind of like you said, you know, Tony, the whole, uh, how how can I get six months of savings when I'm just living hand to mouth now? You know, don't even, you know, keep that as an overall template and a big goal. But in the moment, think about, like, if you're not doing anything financially right now, like, just make, just a, make a budget, like, make a monthly budget. Just do that. Like, do the next right thing. Even if your monthly budget shows that, you know, when you go like, let's say, OK, we're coming to the end of a month here. So December is a good time to start. You go through November and kind of say how much I spent at restaurants, how much I spent here, how much each of my bills are. And just put that down on paper or every dollar app. Dave Ramsey's app's a great app that I love electronically. So you set up the every dollar or whatever. Even if you come out negative, like you've still done the next right thing as far as you've made the budget. Then from there, you can say, why did I come out negative? Oh, I spent two thousand dollars eating out at restaurants. Maybe I shouldn't have done that, you know. Mm-hmm. And then make a plan to go to the grocery store, or you know, hey, you know what? I have all this frozen meat in the fridge, which you know, been guilty of in our, you know, that we've let go bad. You know, it's like maybe I shouldn't let this what I have frozen in my freezer go bad. I should actually eat it and get creative and make something. So just do the next right thing in being disciplined rather than, because sometimes everything quote unquote you have to do. And I say everything loosely because do we have to do everything right now? Not always, but we can feel like it. So I think in that case, just do the next right thing, celebrate that success and then move forward. Because here's the thing, as you keep doing the next right thing, you know, one budget's not going to fix it, but you know, you do a year's worth of budgets and you start paying off a little bit of debt, you know, it's because even sometimes for us, we start seeing now we're getting toward like bigger student loan balances because the whole Ramsey way is, you know, you pay off smallest amounts first, build your momentum. Well, now we're getting to the point where we're on the bigger balances. So we don't necessarily see the 
instant gratification. It's not like when we started with like pay off the $80 medical bill and it's like done, Woo! you know, right. now it's like pay off the 10, $11,000 student loan. And that doesn't disappear in one budget or one month or three months. You know, that's something where you're just kind of chipping away at, chipping away at. And then all of a sudden you get to a point, like I know, you know, we had paid off her car earlier this year, you know, that was about a 15 grand starting balance, you know, and there was a time where I'm like, why, why did we buy this? Like, you know, why did we have to, you know, this was not the best decision we made, it but, was not. but you know, then as it was one of those, like, I just thought it would never go away. And then all of a sudden I'm like, babe, we're down to the last like two grand on the car. And it's like, we're down to the last one. Mm -hmm. And as we kept doing the right thing, I'm like, we're down to the last payment. Yeah. Like we're done. Yeah. So it's one of those things like, you know, it, it will get there, but just keep doing the next right thing, you know, in the moment, like that's, you know, you don't have to fix it all like, and, and be okay with that. I think, you know, contentment plus godliness is great gain. You know, I think there, there is a contentment factor that comes in this whole thing, because if you want to have something long-term, you can't have it all now. And if you're not content, you know, I think when we're not content, then we make bad decisions because we feel like, I have to do something to fix it all now. So, you know, my contentment might say, well, I want to just live how I want to live. And I, you know, I'm never going to get out of debt anyway, and I'm not content. So I'll just right. go out and rack up more debt. Whereas if you're content, it's like, hey, you know what? I know we still have debt. We still are walking this journey. We're not done. You know yeah. what I mean? We're, but at the same time, I'm content to say, hey, you know what? Whatever interest we get charged, you know, we're going to do the best to alleviate as much as we can. But you know, what we have to pay, we have to pay. And we're content. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. And Miss Erica, what advice do you have for people who are seeking discipline? I would say that you fill your space with what you are in need of in that moment. That's yeah. what's really helped me. So I started listening to teaching on discipline. I started reading about discipline. I started only discussing this was this is big ladies hear me on this you cannot talk about a subject matter with a friend or a family member who isn't in that like in that same mindset as you mm -hmm. right and so the 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 circle of people for whom i discuss finances with is very small because i need them to be people who are of disciplined mindset who are not going to say things to me like, oh, girl, you don't work hard enough. You all right. Just go ahead. And I, I, I'm not in a place where I can hear that negativity right now. Right. Like I need the people who are like, yeah, girl, keep running. Right. Like I'm out here running, too. And I'm one of my oldest and dearest friends. We've been friends since the third grade. Um, she's extremely financial, dis financially disciplined as well. Single mom who managed to get out of debt on her own. So it is possible right um she is my biggest accountability on the on the discipline side right mm -hmm. so we we are always talking about what new change what new thing what have you done right she started a business because she was like well i saw how much success that you were having with your business i decided i want to go out and start my own business and now she's out here doing her thing with her business and increasing her income and she moved and she did a lot of things to like you know you know change her her financial thing so i would say just fill your space with right what you need to hear in order to get more to get more of that discipline i just want to piggyback on that is that uh I think there's a there's an additional challenge within the American Christian church because for us, I know us, you know, us four, because my wife is watching you all and just amen. And I know she's amen. I can almost hear her amen from downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but with us, you know, we're always going to minister to people. We're always yeah. going to be there for people. We're always going to love on people. But we have to kind of separate who we're ministering to because some of the people we're ministering to, their conversation is not the conversation that we need in order to get our minds right, right. in order for us to go to the next level. Right, right, right. So, so, so um, you know, I always kind of make a di distinction like, okay, there's people that I minister to, but then there's people that I need to have Christian friendships with yes. that I can allow into my circle. Yes. That that, uh, you know, to use a, a tough expression, you know, that I can that I can bleed on, that I can yes. sweat, yeah. you know, that I can sweat with, that I can share with 
that have that same conversation because sadly financial brokenness in the American Christian community community is actually the norm. Yes. Nowadays, you know, yes. so that's normal to be yes. broke and to go from paycheck to even for people who make money. Yeah. It's, it's normal, you know? Yes. So, uh, I try to kind of separate myself and say, okay, these, you know, I minister over here and I try to make a difference. But then the, when I, when I'm talking about conversations, when I'm talking about, uh, mindsets, you know, I try to kind of be a little more distinguishing because you, if you, if you, <laughs> it is so easy to get caught in a conversation where the standards of living paycheck to paycheck is just normal. And yeah. like, like that's how we're supposed to live. And I don't believe that's the way God designed us to live. No. Yeah. That God wants us, you know, there's so many scriptures about, oh, no man, anything but love, you know? Okay. <laughs> So, uh, right. or we're slave to the lender. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Now, uh, what book do you recommend with in the Bible? Uh, excuse me. What book do you recommend within the Bible for people who are seeking discipline? Well, I think I just kind of gave it away on that Proverbs. last little comment. Um, definitely Proverbs because it has, you know, wisdom in all kind of ways, you know, discipline in all kind of ways. But I think financially that, you know, I think that whole thing, ironically, you know, it, it talks about teaching children in con in the same context of that the borrower is slave to the lender, you know what I mean? And, you know, you talk about how much people talk about like corporate greed and stuff, you know, if you really believe in, you know, and this is specifically aimed at, you know, probably your more liberal crowd, Democrat crowd, you know, if you believe in the evils of corporate greed, why would you not want to be disciplined so that you're not a slave to them? You know right. what I mean? So that you're not so that what you're paying is not paying them that, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you know, when they're saying, Hey, here's a new loan so we can make money. You're saying, no, no, I have a budget. I'm going to save up and be disciplined. And I'll buy that in 10 months when I have it in cash, because it's my purchase, not your purchase that you get to get rich off. Of. Right. So I think, and sorry to go on that little tangent, but no, definitely no, no. Proverbs would definitely be just because of the wisdom and the practicality and the fact that um, you know, I know in the battle rap world, one time, one of my buddies who uh, is also a Christian who does, you know, battles, uh, one of the guys who's like a well-known guy for punchlines, um, his name's Rum Nitty. And somebody say, he said, Proverbs is the Rum Nitty of the Bible. Like, it's just punchlines, <laughs> like, you know, but it's those quick takeaways, like, you know, do you remember what this guy says? That was kind of the takeaway of like, everybody can quote so many lines from, you know, Nitty. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, this is the Nitty of the Bible. You know what I mean? Like you can quote so much, but you can apply it too. You know what I mean? Like trust in the Lord, lead not on your own understanding, acknowledge him, um, you know, the borrower slave to the lender. So there's so many, you know, plus the whole 31 books, 31 or 31 chapters, 31, 31 days, days, you know, it's right. kind of like a, you can get yourself even on a discipline of reading it too, yeah. so that you can go through monthly and apply it and get it. I, and for me, I would say the latter half of the book of Romans. Okay. So mm. if you started like in Romans 12 and just mm. went through the end of the book, right? Like our pastor just finished a really great six week series that he entitled Behave Yourself. And he was talking about how in Romans, it really lays out for us as Christians, how we should be, you know, living our lives, right? And how we should be relating one to another, how we should be relating to unbelievers, what, what our speech should be, what our actions should be, what are, mm -hmm. and so for me, I feel like, you know, you could go through that and you could lay it out and you could say, and are my actions lining up, Right with what the, you know, with what the word um, is saying, like it, one thing that stuck out for me in that series, so much of what he was talking about, you know, we've, we've had, we have this huge debate in the world around us around these masks, right? Or should I wear one? Should I not wear one? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it whatever? And, and the thing that he pointed out was how like some in sometimes as believers, our maturity means that we make a sacrifice for others around us, right? And so there, I think there's a great lesson to be learned in that is that sometimes we have to grow our maturity to a level that we're able to make a decision, not necessarily because it benefits me Amen. on the outset, because it benefits somebody else on the outset. So even if I don't believe, uh, you know, let's say I was someone who didn't believe in wearing masks, but I was going to be out amongst a group of people for whom it was very important. 
the mature part of me puts the mask on. Amen. Right? Because I'm because I'm making a sacrifice for somebody else. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I think that that to me right now is where where I've really been focused a lot of my study is in is in um the in in the latter half of of the um of the uh, 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 book of Romans. Um, I will also recommend another book that I think is um, has really uh, kind of ministered to me in this season. The book is called The Greatest You. The great and it is The Greatest You. It is written by a young man by the name of Trent Shelton. He's okay. a former um, NFL player. Um, he, he played college football and then played professional football for a few years but his professional football career never really took off he like became a football player and then retired all in like a three-year stint so his career was very short um and he he said he struggled with that because he was like i spent my whole life mm. preparing for something that only lasted 26 months wow Right. And he was mm -hmm. like, I had to ask God why. Right. And God was like, because I was preparing you to actually become the better version of who you were. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now God has given him a platform where he is just out speaking and encouraging. He has an Instagram page. He does TikTok. So you guys can look him up online if you're if you're big with online. I think he's got a podcast now. He's written this book. But he's sharing his testimony about learning more about discipline. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you guys, I, I read a lot about discipline. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how it, what he thought he was learning as a kid playing football in order to prepare for this NFL career actually has prepared him to live the most disciplined life, mm -hmm. right, that he could live. And so he breaks down learning discipline around, you know, everything about football and how it's helped him live this, this life. And so it's an amazing book. I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, if you're looking for just a, something that is biblically grounded, obviously, but um, just a, you know, just kind of that self-help, you know, category. Well, I'm gonna try to get him on the show as well. So uh, definitely yeah. reach out. He's yeah. he is good peeps. He's he's amazing. Yeah, I'll have him on and Chris uh, Chris Hogan on my board. yeah. yeah. I love that. <laughs> I'm here for that. Well, by the time we get big enough, Dave will probably be retired. So that's why. There I'm you go. There you go. Some guy's got to take hey. that mantle. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, Evan, who do you? Uh, what is there a secular book that you would recommend? that uh you know that that people should use in order to get either financially disciplined or disciplined across the board sure so i'll kind of answer that on um, both sides so i think you know financially disciplined obviously i'd recommend anything i think total money makeover um if you don't know where to start financially it's kind of like lays out the whole ramsey principles and steps from one to seven how to get there kind of what to do at each step like it talks about you know, with like, for instance, you know, what's called baby step two, pay off all non-mortgage debt, like where we are right now. It gives a little more detail on kind of like our situation. What do you do if your debt's larger, you know, and it's not something you're going to conquer in 12 to 18 months. How do you make sure you have like an emergency fund through that and plan through that? So it gives a little more detail to the steps. So it's pretty, I think that's like a good starting point. Obviously, anything, um, you know, Ken Coleman, um, one of the Ramsey personalities, has one called The Proximity Principle, which is really like a good career planning book. It's about networking, kind of getting around people where you can, you know, practice in your career, get in the right place to kind of have the career you want. Um, there, You know, Chris Hogan's got some good books out there. Rachel Cruz has one, Live Your Life, Not Theirs, you know, kind of the contentment plus the finance, debt-free degree, Anthony O'Neill. Um, another book I'd recommend kind of outside the Ramsey standpoints, um, this is more a business side, but also has a lot of discipline in it is uh, Jim Collins, Good to Great. I read recently. I really like that book. I think it, um, you know, the one thing I like, it talks about from a business standpoint, but I think this can apply personally is um, the hedgehog concept where it talks about, you know, when a fox is trying to hunt a hedgehog, you know, the fox has many different approaches. He might come through the bushes. He might rush it in the open. He might jump out of something. He might sneak up on it. The hedgehog's got one game. 
I go in the ball and put the quills up. <laughs> you know, that's the only thing that's the hedgehog the got. He's got okay. But as long as the hedgehog gets in the ball and puts the quills up, it's good. And it talked about like, you know, this was more focused, the book's focused on companies, you know, and performance, but it talks about like the great companies that had returns year after year were solid on their hedgehog company. Like they knew what their core was and they did it. Right. You know, they didn't try to, you know, they talked about like a Walgreens versus, and they, what they study, it's really cool. They study like these top good to great companies and they have a whole they, I mean, they, a lot of data went into this study, you know, and I, I'm not even sure I totally understand it all because literally the last hundred pages is just all the methodologies <laughs> and graphs of it. And it's a little over my non quite analytical head. You know, I'm a people person, but it uh, it does compare them to companies in similar in, in the same industry that didn't have the same returns. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it talked about like a like a Walgreens they used as one of the companies. And they said, you know, Walgreens was very much about like, were the kind of drug convenience store on every corner for all. And they talked about like how in the seventies they got away from different things. Like they used to serve like hot foods at certain ones, which I didn't know that, but you know, they kind of cut away and just did their core concept. Whereas all these other people were trying to get into this market and that market and they just focused here. So I think that's kind of the core of it is, you know, find what your core concept is. Like I like, you know, even your podcast becoming disciplined, you know, you're not trying to do, be like, okay, I'm going to do spiritual gifts and I'm going to do <laughs> Christian hip hop, deep analysis, and I'm going to do right. business and it's I'm going to talk thing. about sports. It's like, I'm talking about discipline, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's your core concept, you know, and everything comes back to that. So it's kind of like, no matter what comes at you, you know, Hedgehog puts the quills up. That, yeah. That's the one move it's got, but that's the move that it's good at. Yeah. It's actually interesting that you mentioned that we had a women's event last night and, um, the, the speaker, Havila Cunnington, I don't know if you've ever heard of her, um, she was talking about David, right? And how um, when the time came for, um, you know, the people to, uh, 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 you know, slay Goliath, right? David, David's supposed to be out there delivering lunch and he shows up and everybody's just sitting around on the battlefield, right? And he's like, why are y'all just sitting here? Like, I thought y'all were, he thought he was showing up and they were actually going to be in the heat of battle. And they were like, man, ain't nobody going to beat Goliath, right? So we're like, not even trying to waste our time, like wasting our energy. And David's like, well, I'll do it. Right. And, th and they're like, okay, cool. Well, let's set you up with Saul's armor and we'll get you a sword and we'll do all these things. And David's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm d I got my slingshot right? and I have five stones. And it makes me think about that whole idea. Like David didn't, she, she said that David didn't try to be anybody else sure. in that moment. Right. He mm -hmm. knew that what God gave him was exactly what he needed to do, what he needed to do in order to slay his giant. So he wasn't going to try to use somebody else's armor or use someone else's sword or become somebody else. He just did him, right? Like this, this is you. So you you go and God is going to give that giant over to you. She was really just talking, helping to encourage people, women during this time of, you know, quarantine and COVID and all these things that are happening. Like, she's like, what if this is your giant? and you're just missing it like everybody's sitting back like oh i'm so i'm so dismayed i'm so depressed she's like go grab up your slingshot Amen. and slay your giant yeah Amen. like if this if this is what has been given to you you go take that land right like you go do that thing and so it was just it's just really good to think about that from both perspectives right like the, if the hedgehog thing works for you great but if you have to think about you know don't go put on somebody else's armor mm -hmm. In this season, right? Like, um, you know, just, just, just do what God has given you to do. Well, let me piggyback on that, especially for us four here. Uh, you know, God is refining us and making us more disciplined. Um, I want to share this: is that before David fought Goliath, it's, it says that he had the confidence to fight Goliath. That's right, because he killed the lion and the. Yep. Yeah, that was his mm -hmm. preparation, yep. right? Kind of I think that COVID for many of us is not our Goliath, Ooh. but it's, it's getting us ready for our wow. Goliath. Mm, like that's it. good. Because, for like, for instance, like for you and for me, staying home and chilling, you know, like it, that's not the worst thing in the world, but getting healthy physically, yes. getting healthy financially, getting all these things set up 
so that when the Goliath comes, we're ready. Because yeah. I think that there's a, I, there's just, I'm not trying to scare all of our listeners, but no, I think no. that, that there is a Goliath that is coming. Oh, yeah. You know, we study debt and, and we know how much debt the, the country has. Yeah. So uh, there's a Goliath that's coming and we need to get ready for that. I mean, those, those of us who grew those of us who grew up in church circles. Right. Like I, I tell people all the time I've been in church since mm-hmm. the womb, literally. Yeah. Like those of us who have been in church circles, we have heard people say all the time. Oh, this is this is the end times right. the world's coming back. This is the end times, right? Like we've heard people say that for generations. And as at one point during the pandemic, I woke up one morning and I was, you know, I talked, I talked to the Lord in my morning prep time. That's, that's like my prayer time. And so I was preparing for the day and I, and I was saying, I was like, oh Lord, is, is it the end times? Like, is this, like, is this the thing? Right. And it's not like, I'm not saying that I felt like God was like, yes, you know, this is, this is it. But like you said, this is clearly preparing us, right. For something that is to come because it's not just me or you, the whole world, right. right, Is walking through this thing together. So this is clearly bigger than us. That's right. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that, 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 if nothing else, I think God just needed to remind people, hey, y'all, hey, I'm in charge. <laughs> this guy over here, right? Like, because it, it, there is no other entity, no other power, no other anything else that could shut down the entire world. Right. Amen. Not just one country, not just one company, not the whole world. Amen. Right? Amen. And I, it was funny. I was, I, it, this is my, in, my teacher brain for a second. So just follow me here. I was talking to one of my students the other day, and we were laughing about the shortage of toilet paper thing that's happening again, right? And people are like, oh, God, why is there no toilet paper? So let me help people understand what the issue is about the toilet paper. Everybody yeah. ready? Okay. It's not about the toilet paper. It's about the packaging that things like toilet paper and paper towels come in. Mm. Because we don't produce those items in the U.S. Mm. So the plastic with all the paint and all the color and all the stuff that your toilet paper is wrapped in, that is an import. Oh, wow. That comes from another place. Wow. This is why we have shortages because the people who make the packaging are behind in production. Mm. We are not out of toilet paper. We are out of packaging. Oh, wow. And if people would really be okay with just buying loose <laughs> this toilet paper Tie it together for me. Like we would be okay. Sam's Club. Just put it. Just put it in the little box and stack it. I'll just put it in the cart and take it out. It is. It's the packaging. And it was so funny when I said that to my students. They were like, it was like an epiphany moment to them. They were like, oh, that makes so much sense, right? Because we invest in our culture so much in packaging. Wow. Right. Like everything has to be packaged properly in order for us to want to buy it. And so that's what's slowing down the toilet paper, people, is the packaging. It's not the toilet paper. The itself. Package? And no one is hoard. I mean, there probably are some people that are hoarding toilet paper, but not that many people have like gobs and gobs of toilet paper in their house right now. So that's so they, 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 they need to make it like a military supply store where you they just, do. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we need to go back to the. Uh, what was it called? Uh, the, commissary. Uh, commissary. commissary. We need to go back to the commissary days. It would so be so much easier. So, so basically, you're saying that the, pa- the the shortage on packaging is slowing down the substance. There is a message in that. So <laughs> yes, that's a yeah. That'll preach, as we say in the church. That'll that's preach. preach. <laughs> now, now we've had a lo- We have had an incredible time talking to you all, becoming disciplined. We want to make sure that we can stay connected to you. So here's there's here's a couple of websites if you all could tell us. Uh the website to the jewelry business, if you could share that, the yep. website to your entertainment business, a website or an email where we can contact you in the Pennsylvania area or even broader now that we're in the new Zoom culture for financial training. Uh and then also uh the website of where you all fellowship at. Can y'all share those four with us? Or if there's one I forgot, you know, anything yeah. else. So I'll start. So my my um, the website for the jewelry business is just five buck bling boutique dot com. So the number five um, buck bling boutique dot com. 
Um, I also have a Facebook page, right? So you can look me up on Facebook, either by my name, Erica Tashwire, or by the business name as well. You'll find me there. Um, and the and our church is Allison Park Church. And so um, the website is just allisonparkchurch.com. And Allison is spelled with two L's, mm-hmm. A-L-L-I-S-O-N parkchurch.com and then for the entertainment so stellar fusion entertainment on facebook s-t-e-l-l-a-r capital f-u-s-i-o-n entertainment um and then on 3pfd that's my artist name number 3pfd all caps um on all social media to reach me and then on the financial coaching side um i can actually be reached at for just first and last name evan tashwire at gmail.com e-v-a-n-t-a-c-h-o-i-r and you should have my name on the whole um thing here at gmail.com so that's um i can be reached there so yeah we do like i said we do financial coaching a little bit of consulting you know i do in addition kind of with the financial coaching we also do consulting on like disc personality profile team building because i do a lot of that on my day job I mentioned like Clifton Strengths. Do I do a lot with soft skills? That's kind of where my professional lies. That in recruiting, um, professionally HR. So, you know, we do we do all a little bit, a little bit of everything. You know, just really try to. I think you know the one thing about training. It's kind of the Trent Shelton example really spoke to me. I was almost teared up when you shared it because I felt like I kind of felt like that's how like there was a time where I was a short time in my life where I was trying to do the music business full time and things didn't work in the way that I had really hoped or wanted. And I kind of felt the same way Trent did like, okay, God, I, this was what I really wanted. Like, and now this didn't work and like, what's going on, you know, but now I see where I'm at now that there were things I learned in that season that God was preparing for me now in what I'm doing. So I think, you know, seeing, seeing that has been really cool. And one thing it's done is I think just brought a humility to me where I've been like, all right, God, you know what? I don't have to have a platform. I don't have to do this. Like, I just want to know you and be useful where I can. So yeah. that's why, you know, we kind of dabble and go where God opens doors. You know, if God opens a door on a music side, I'm will, you know, and it makes sense, I'm willing to be you. Same with financial coaching, same with, you know, jobs, same with marriage, whatever it is, even this, like you having us, you know, to say, hey, come, you know, can you come on and discuss finances? Sure. If this blesses you and blesses your listeners and your wife and your family, you know, then God's used us and that's cool. You know what I mean? We made a little bit of difference. So I just want to make a difference wherever I can. Yeah. So I thank you both. And I thank you for coming on. And the reason why I encourage people to reach out to you all for financial assistance is when you go on CNN and and you go on, you know, version, I guess, you know, she doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore, but versions of the Oprah Winfrey show. Yeah. Yeah. Where you have people giving financial advice. You have people giving financial advice that don't seem real to me. Mm-hmm. And Eva, Evan and Erica seem real to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that people, that they can that they can relate to someone who has just, you know, uh, a guy that I would like to get on here for physical fitness is a guy named Bricks. And he has this thing called Bricks Fitness where he's a big guy like myself. And then now he got, he became, you know, he, he, got, he still has the excess skin on his stomach but he's gotten muscular and he's even engaged in um uh weightlifting competitions you know where he you know bodybuilding competitions but he used to be 350 380 pounds that's the type of guy that i want on this show because there are certain people who they you know you could tell they fell out of bed you know in great shape you know (laughs) they're not going to be the ones that inspire you know people who need to get in shape they need they need people like bricks yeah. They need to hear from folks who've had three hundred thousand dollars worth of student loan debt, and you know, and have knocked out one hundred ninety-five thousand. You know, they need to hear real stories from real people. Right. Amen. We thank right. you for the authenticity of your testimony. We thank you for your journey. We thank you for all that you all have shared, and we thank you for being you. We thank you for being filled with Christian love and and a desire to help other people become more discipline so thank you so much thank, thank you, you. Tony. i appreciate you having discipline. subscribe now the tashwar family has eliminated over a hundred and ninety five thousand dollars worth of debt they have become disciplined and hopefully something was said during this interview to help you on your path of becoming disciplined